Hello, everyone, and welcome to the February 2021 Talking Team webinar. My name is Nilu Parvinashtiani, and I'll be helping with the facilitation of today's webinar. We at the National Operations Center of Excellence are very grateful for the Federal Highway Administration and also Paul and Jim's uh, work who help organize uh, the Talking Team webinar series, including this one. Um, so uh, just a quick note. Um, about the National Operations Center of Excellence, or NOCO, as you may already know. Uh, we offer resources for the transportation system management and operations community. So um, on your screen right now, you see a series of web links um, that would help you to find resources related to team and also just general resources on the NOCO website. So, the talking team web links are on the top right. Below that is the NOCO useful links. And uh, below that, you can see the download pod where you can access the PDF of the presentations uh, from today's webinar. A um, few other logistics for the webinar today. We are recording the webinar. And that recording, along with the presentation slides, will also be available on the NOCO on demand learning. Uh, section of the website. Um, the attendee phones are on listen-only mode, but please stay engaged. Uh, you know, put in any questions or any comments you have throughout uh, the webinar in the question discussion pod that you see on the screen right now and uh, that you are using. Um, we are saving the questions for the very end of the webinar, but uh, we'll keep an eye on those, and at the very end, the moderator, uh, who is a Paul Jordan, will read each of those questions and will pose them at the presenter. So uh, that is all I, all I had. And with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Paul Jordan, who will be our moderator for the day. Paul. Thanks, Nilo. And once again, thank you for your uh, very efficient and talented um, support of Jim and I for this uh, webinar and several other things actually as well. But uh, I just wanted to say good afternoon to Tim Nation out there. It's uh, great to see everyone signing in and saying hello to each other. And um, and uh, we're very excited, as usual, to see you all and to see you all participating with us. And um, But we're also excited today because it's uh, the last week of February. Um, uh, not only that, but um, because of our speakers today. We're um, uh, having a, a little bit unusual presentation for us. As you know, you all know, most of you know anyways, that we typically have practitioners uh, do presentations um, and not ask vendors or representatives of vendors uh, participate. But we thought, uh, Jim and I thought, and. Uh, as, an, uh, as part of the Everyday Counts initiative, the technology piece, the piece that um, you know is, is uh, uh, focusing on digital alerts to Everyday Counts, we we um, we really had some discussions with some of the manufacturers' representatives, and um, and uh, where we typically might have someone, for example, that has deployed one of the technologies, um, you know, one of our practitioners, one of us, um, we. We um, we thought we thought hearing directly from the vendor would have value, and they have they actually share some perspectives and some some of their um, their um, technologies. Uh, you know, that, that the typical practitioner may may not be aware of. We'll probably be having some of those practitioners in future events. Um, so, so with that, we want to give um, make sure it's understood that the U.S. government does not endorse products on manufacturers' trademarks. And our manufacturers' names that appear in this report are only because they are considered essential to this presentation. Um, but again, we want to repeat, Jim and I do not endorse any of these products. Federal Highway does not. Um, but we, um, we certainly like to share as in our role as, um, as facilitators of technology transfer throughout the country uh, you know, the, what, what these folks have to share. Um, so what we're going to have today is a presentation on the Haas Alert. I know um, many of you are, are familiar with at least the name. Um, actually, Corey is not making it today. Today we have uh, Jeremy Ungle, 
I'm going. <laughs> I'm going, Nick. I'm sorry. Um, I butcher that, Jim. Just like I said, I would, but not intentionally. Um, and um, on, so he's going to give us, um, you know, some some um, information on that hospital technology. And then Mike Walsh, uh, who is um, um, going to give us some information on the make, um, make way uh, safety uh, technology that they've they've, they've um, founded. Um, by the way, um, and um, by the way, all of our speakers have interesting backgrounds. Mike Mike is a banker actually, and uh, and is founding this um, this technology to help our responders save. And uh, if if you get a chance, read read the. Um, Read, read some of the backgrounds and the bios that we provided, the shot bios that we provided. I won't go over them now. But also Ross Slickler from Icone is with us, and he'll highlight um, some of the cool products that they have that helps with work zone safety. And uh, you know, and of course, um, uh, what we're trying to what we're trying to do is protect our roadside workers and responders. So um, with that, uh, with, with Nilo, so. It, at the end of this presentation, uh, of all of all the presentations, we're going to have some uh, questions that we want you to participate in. So don't run away without answering the questions. It'll only take a few minutes. Um, next month, uh, we're we're going to have, um, I think, again, some boots on the ground type um, responders and, and folks that um, you know do practical applications. So the Nebraska, uh, they have a temporary. Uh, Tow temporary traffic control program with where um, they have they have um, relationships with the towers that that uh, provide traffic control in some of the some of the areas of Nebraska. Uh, Chief Robert Fright Frighty Fright will 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 talk about uh, fire truck attenuators that they have installed down there. Um, if if you guys recall, he last month he he he. he spoke up to us and we was talking about funding for a few minutes during the chat period. And then an old friend of mine, um, Neil Boudreau, is going to talk to you about their recent experience with updating and actually adding um, legislation, uh, part of the TIM legislation that I think sometimes we forget about. Um, and, and he'll give us uh, some, you know, his experience and, and, and some of the data that they use to convince the legislator to update the um, driver removal and respond to safety. Uh, um, legislation. So with that, I'm going to pass on to my partner in crime, Mr. Jim Ostridge, who's going to give us an update on the um, uh, training and some other things. So, that Jim? Thanks, Paul, and welcome again, everyone. Good afternoon and good morning in some cases. Um, really appreciate that one point, and we'll talk a little bit more later about the, uh, the fact that you guys have helped uh, uh, enlarge the the uh, the reach of the Talking Tim webinar. Our our numbers have doubled and continue to grow. And we really appreciate you sharing this with all your partners and stakeholders um, in your state. So thanks again. So real quick, because these presentations are are really exciting. Um, we're looking forward to hearing for all three of them. The update right now, as of the 15th, you can see over 515,000 responders trained. I'll point to the fact that the web-based training continues to grow, and it's approaching 100,000 responders trained. Uh, uh, as you can see, the National Highway Institute, the web-based training there, and our dear friends um, uh, over at Emergency Responder Safety Institute, which uh, both trainings are free, and both uh, really are an, ex uh, an excellent choice option, if you will, uh, especially if you're not uh, allowed, uh, your state authorities or whatnot aren't allowing you to do in-person training. So uh, sad news, well, not, not on this slide, <laughs> sorry about that. The, uh, the, one of the national maps, I don't include them all anymore uh, per your all's request. You know, I know sometimes it's just redundant and it gets kind of boring, but uh, I slap my wrist there because this is never boring. This is super important, the work that you're all doing across this land to save lives, time, and money. But this map actually represents the picture of um, the 
the in-person training above the above, top number uh, versus the uh, web-based training number below. Uh, Self-explanatory, another one, two seconds. Next is the total trained by state. You can pick out your state and you see where you're at. Uh, we have a long way to go for sure. Um, so you, as you always hear me say, keep pushing the training uh, web base. And if you're one of those that are doing in person, good for you. The national map, there's 24 states still that are above the 45% goal. Uh, and there are several states that are looking at their numbers um, to make sure utilizing, got a great, uh, utilizing the data, I should say, that now uh, uh, the leaders of your states, if you're, if you're interested, are receiving now the Excel spreadsheet uh, of, of the entire uh, country, all the state uh, TIN training statistics, uh, great uh, Excel workbook that our uh, contractor Battelle and HNTB, uh, specifically the great Katie Belmore maintains for us and has for many years. That workbook has all the statistics you need to really analyze uh, your TIN training program. So take advantage of that if you're you're not aware. You want to you know uh, be you know have any questions for Paul, Joe, or myself? Please let us know. But uh, that is a wonderful tool. And uh, I got I don't know if Gary Ogletree's on today from the great state of Tennessee. But he sent a phenomenal email yesterday that I started to share with the country. But just to tell you real quick, it basically, he was telling all the stakeholders. He's Gary's the statewide TIM coordinator in Tennessee, an old, uh, uh, well, uh, a great, not an old, uh, Paul and I are the older ones. Uh, uh, Gary uh, has been the coordinator and champion in Tennessee for many years. But he shared the, the spreadsheets and the documents, the, these maps, with all the stakeholders in Tennessee to remind them not only about where they're at with their total number of responders to be trained, um, goal setting, as well as just analyzing, using the spreadsheet to, to, uh, to um, uh, you know, discuss, have discussions through TIM committees and whatnot of where the training needs to uh, expand uh, by county or otherwise. So Gary, if you're listening, uh, I just have to show you off because that, that kind of email is what Paul, Joe, and I would love for each one of you. And, and a lot of you on this call are leaders and you're doing similar things. I'm not saying that Gary's the old, only one, but you certainly uh, should take advantage of the, the those spreadsheets and maps uh, uh, to collaborate deeper uh, with the training, uh, expanding the training with your stakeholders. Next is just a quick update, you know, um, in particular about the academies. We have just recently picked up uh, for, you know, from a while back ago, actually it's been a couple of years where we started polling or uh, surveying, if you will, uh, to the extent possible, because we're really not supposed to be surveying uh, your, your your state as to what which fire or police academy or tech college universities in your state have adopted the TIM training. We are actually over 150. This slide I know says 120. But this is something I need you to think about because we're going to uh, uh, approach you, many of you, regarding this subject. This is a very important subject that goes to the institutionalization of the TIM training. And uh, you can see that, that bottom bullet, 49 of 50 states have one or more academies. And there are states that uh, the uh, in-service uh, uh, training, that is once you graduate at police fire uh, fighter graduated for, from an academy um, that uh, you can take the TIM training to get credits for your in-service. Let's see, here's the map. This map was developed by our, our contractor AEM uh, to show you, you know, 
in color, the red obviously fire, the blue police, uh, where, uh, well, there's a key there too. You can see towing is in there. Uh, and um, anyway, just a, a graphic to show you uh, that this is, this is happening and we need you to continue. Paul, I know I'm over here. So this last slide, I believe this is sad state of affairs. I don't know if this number has gone up in the past several days, but as of the 17th, uh, we've lost five officers uh, in the line of duty, struck by, and one tower. Uh, who knows what the uh, what the injuries are? And uh, oh, the the new the new website, the new SharePoint site for trainers. If you're a trainer or your cadre of trainers in the state, the new website is actually active and uh, has been launched as of a, a week ago. Actually, yeah, actually, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we're going to be adding a, a form for CAPSI and IATALYS, which has to do with EMS. CAPSI has to do with certification, recertification for EMS personnel, and IATALYS for law enforcement. Those forms are going to be added to the website. And this site is only for trainers, only for trainers. The in, the in-person and web-based trainings are in the process of being refreshed. Uh, so we have a committee that's in the process of doing that. Very excited to give the not only the content and, and pictures, videos, and statistics uh, 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 a refresh. That's that's underway as well as we're we're getting ready to launch here in March uh, another tool for you, which is the instructor-led Tim training mobile lab um, development. So I think that was it. Nope, NTIRAW, just know that it's coming up November 7th through the 13th of this year. Planning is going to be a lot bigger effort this year, folks, and stay tuned for that. Uh, really exciting. We're going to have more support, and we're engaging uh, the major associations to help us. And now we thank you, and here's our contact info. Thanks for all you're doing. Keep up the great work. All thanks. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, so just, just putting you guys on notice, putting everyone on notice, we're going to be showing the map. We're going to be showing our map. You know how we love maps to, uh, to make sure we, we're getting all the information. So if you have an academy out there or are you, are you, um, are you working with an academy out there, some way, that's in, some way that we can show um, the our area is getting, um, you know, uh, you know, heading towards institutionalization with the training uh, we we want to hear from you so uh, that we can uh, we can uh, add it to our map add it to our map and um, by the way Jim Gary would agree that he's old too like us so um, that's the only other thing so next up, <laughs> next up is um, is Jeremy and I'll let him introduce himself he has actually uh, jumped in at the last minute to um, uh, to cover for Corey, uh, who is, um, I guess, the CEO of, of Haas. But um, I'll, uh, I'll just let um, Jeremy, you take it from here. How's that? Great. Thank you, uh, Paul. And thank you, everyone, for, uh, for giving us the opportunity here. And, and, Paul, don't feel bad. I'm more surprised when people pronounce my last name correctly uh, than incorrectly. So, uh, so, so no worries there. Um, well, great. So we're, we're really excited uh, today to talk about what Haas Alert is doing to keep uh, roadway responders, first responders, roadway workers safer uh, while they're out on the roadway. And I, I think just as importantly, um, all the information that we're collecting in real time about the, the, the work and the people in the roadway, making that available to the traffic and information management systems and other operational centers that you guys are all operating, so you can incorporate that information into the broader safety and operational benefits that uh, that, that you all are doing day in, day out. So we, we, uh, we appreciate this opportunity. Uh, so Haas Alert, uh, we got started uh, about five or six years ago. We're a Chicago-based company. Um, actually, Corey and I both worked um, at a, a digital mapping and navigation uh, company called Here Maps. Um, so we're very familiar with the automotive industry, and, and that's critically important for the work that we're doing because um, really at the end of the day, we need to make drivers aware of 
stuff that's going on in the road, if people that are out there doing, you know, keeping our roads safe and, and clear. Um, and, and so our expertise there is really a critical driver in, uh, in making that possible. Um, you, you, you can see a number of the things that, uh, you know, a number of stats about the company. Um, you, you know, the, the biggest thing for us is the partners that we're, we've been working with so far. A number of you are on the, the call here today. Uh, but also the fact that, that we're, we're really part of a broader ecosystem, right? We're looking to partner with other technologies that, that are being used today, and you see some of the logos of other companies uh, that we have relationships with. So we're really trying to be that connective, that connective tissue between the vehicles and the people and the, the, the work zone activities that's going on, and how do we deliver these real-time alerts um, through digital alerting um, into into the drivers' you know, ears and eyes, and, and, and into the the smarter vehicles that are on the roadway today. Um, and you know, some of the work that we're doing it, it is getting recognized, which is great. You know, we're 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 being appreciated and recognized, especially in the automotive uh, industry, for the value that we're bringing to uh, to, to the mobility markets. So, you know, I, I know, unfortunately, Jim, you know, alluded to, you know, some of the incidents earlier this year and the fatalities. You know, this is a major problem that you are all very aware of. Um, actually, our, our company got started after Corey um, almost got struck and killed by an ambulance um, while they were both driving through an intersection in downtown Chicago about six years ago. Um, so this is very near and dear to, uh, to him and to our company. And you know, every day we see multiple occurrences of crashes and collisions happening. Um, and we know there has to be a, a, you know, a way to solve for this, and that's why we exist as a company, to, to bring this number down, down to zero. And you know, from our perspective, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into you know, why, these, why these types of collisions and unsafe situations are occurring. Uh, for us, we're really focused on the distracted, the distracted driving of how do we get the people inside the vehicles today more aware of their surroundings so that you know, these types of situations can be avoided altogether. Uh, and you know, work zones are a you know, increasingly important part of the work that we are doing, right? It, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a focus nationally of increasing the safety within work zones. And a lot of the, the new work that we're doing you know, is extending well beyond uh, public safety um, and into you know, the work zone and construction and, and, uh, and, and these types of markets to keep those you know, workers uh, safer while they're out there. So ultimately, you know, there's you know, slow down, move over laws everywhere. And you know, our system is really designed to increase uh, increase driver compliance with slow down move over laws nationally. Right, and all 50 states now have some form of slow down move over. And uh, the challenge is, how do we get drivers to be more aware of these situations sooner, so that they have the ability to comply and and and, and you know, slow down and move over in a way that's safe. Um, you know, that's the focus of how can we increase uh, the, you know, the driver's awareness of those situations. So the good news is, is that we know that digital alerting works. Um, a study was performed uh, a couple years ago that actually measured the impact of a driver receiving an alert, a digital alert, um, in advance of a, of a potential hazardous situation. Um, if they can get that alert in advance, the risk of a collision decreases by 90%. So the, the challenge is how do we get that alert out to the driver soon enough? And, and that's where Haas Alert and our safety cloud platform comes in. Now, you know, there, there's a, been a lot of investment going on um, you know, in the automotive markets to make their vehicles safer and more intelligent about what's going on uh, around that vehicle. And, the, you know, the way we like to describe that and kind of the visual that you're looking at here is that these cars and all their sensors and cameras that are starting to, to come on them um, are really uh, focused on what's immediately around that, that vehicle or the micro perception uh, of that vehicle. Uh, where where Hostler comes in is really extending the visibility of that vehicle um, and, and really think of Safety Cloud as an off-board sensor 
to that to that car that's driving on the road now. Um, and the great thing about it from the car company's perspective is that there's nothing additional that they have to add to their vehicle. It's strictly a, a, a software um, update to the vehicle to be able to trigger these digital alerts inside the infotainment screens or instrument clusters uh, and to integrate it into their ADAS systems. Um, so the, the, you know, the, the amount of effort that they have to do to bring these digital alerts to life um, is, is not as large as you know, adding new hardware to the car, which can take years to, to go through from a, an automotive life cycle standpoint. So uh, today, you know, so today we are already um, integrating our digital alerts into uh, the Waze navigation system, which you guys are are probably all very familiar with. Um, so, so just to kind of visualize what this what this looks like, on the left hand side is what the alert looks like when uh, the phone is plugged into the car's uh, infotainment system um, and connected through either Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, um, and on the right is uh, what the image looks like on your, on your phone itself. So it supports uh, both types of use cases. Um, a, a couple of key things here is that the messaging is adjustable. So, uh, you know, the, if you can see the, like the blue text um, on the screen on the right here, we can get very descriptive as to what's going on and uh, you know, um, instructions even to, to kind of give to the driver. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility we have there, but, but really most importantly, it's the fact that the driver is able to get an alert, you know, in this example here, almost a half a mile in advance, right? It's not, a, we're not looking for them to, you know, at the last second slam on their brakes or swerve out of the way of, of a, of a you know, on-scene situation. We want them to uh, get that alert earlier so they can slow down, move over in advance. And, uh, and keep everyone safer uh, on the roadways. Now, you know, Waze is great, um, and you know, I, I know everyone has uh, has a good relationship with the Waze platform. But really, you know, the, the, the goal is that the, these types of digital alerts have to be made available inside the head unit of the vehicle. And you see an example. Company that digital alerting needs to be a standard safety feature, just like an airbag, just like a seatbelt. No reason why a, a digital safety feature this, um, you know, shouldn't also be included in that standard safety feature of the car. So you know, that's the that's the real work that we're doing. In addition to working with you know the navigation companies, which is critically important. Um, we know from a, a longer-term perspective, this has to be part of the intelligence of the vehicle. Now, the way we do this is in, in a couple different ways. Um, we can um, activate the, your fleet vehicles onto our platform either through a transponder. Um, you see it uh, pictured here on the left. Um, and this tra transponder was developed in conjunction with the Department of Homeland Security. So we were actually awarded a, a contract uh, from them to, to build out this technology further. Um, and and uh, you know, what's, what's also, I think, important to highlight is that this is a Made in America uh, you know, hardware unit, right, which is critically important for government purchasing. Um, and, and so we're really proud to be, you know, you're so obviously supporting the, the U.S. economy that way. Now, the HA uh, Direct option is where we are able to leverage existing vehicle technology that is already on your vehicles. And we know a lot of them already have you know, telematics or uh, some type of you know, wireless router like a Cradle Point or a Sierra wireless router. Um, there's a number of different technologies that are out there today. So we also have that ability to incorporate um, you know, our software into those systems so that there's no new additional hardware that needs to get added to your vehicles or to your equipment, um, you know, like an arrow board that's out there in the market. Um, in fact, we're working directly with a number of uh, manufacturers um, to, to really add Hostler into their existing um, you know, work zone equipment that they're already putting out there um, so that there's not a need for any other additional hardware 
um, uh, for uh, for those sites. Um, one other thing to note on uh, on our transponder, um, I, I think it's important to mention. So, uh, you know, there there are often times when you, you, the the vehicles or the equipment, you know, for some reason, don't want to be broadcasting their information and don't want to be digitally alerting. Um, so one of the requirements of our project with uh, DHS was to incorporate a kill switch into that device. Um, so we, we've done that, um, and, and you know, we've, that's been validated as well from like state troopers and other uh, other uh, you know, law enforcement uh, agencies really like that uh, that capability to kind of go dark in certain situations when they uh, when they need to. Now. Uh, you know, the other uh, the other aspect that we've added in here is a responder to responder digital alerting. So you know, one of the early pieces of feedback we got from the first responder community specifically was, hey, it's great that you're doing digital alerting for others on the roadway, uh, but what about what about us and in, in, in the, the the close calls and the, the sometimes the collisions we get into with each other? So we've went ahead and developed a kind of specific responder to responder digital alerting service. That lets fire trucks and ambulances and police cars um, all you know, warn each other through this kind of closed real-time uh, digital alerting system. So really, really excited to see that uh, starting to gain some great momentum. Um, you know, and, and the nice thing about um, host alerts technology um, within the public, within the uh, the fire industry specifically, uh, we now come standard on uh, more than 90% of the new fire trucks that are being built. Um, so whether you're buying a Pierce or a Rosenbauer or an E1 Ferrara truck, um, Host Alerts Digital Alerting Service is included for five or ten years at no charge to, to the end customer. Um, that, that's the level of investment and commitment that, they've, that we're making with them, and we're working on similar types of uh, relationships with other, uh, other uh, vehicle manufacturers and other industries. Now we also have a situational awareness dashboard um, that, that comes available. Um, you know, we, we know you guys are already using a lot of dashboards, but there's you know uh, um, you know there's a number of agencies that we're working with that really like to have ours up as another added tool um, in their arsenal. Um, you know, we do have uh, privacy uh, built into the dashboard, uh, which is great. And then this dashboard can also be easily shared with other jurisdictions, other agencies that you may want to grant access to. Uh, for whatever reason, and we can kind of control the access rights that those people have. Um, you, you can give them like a read-only type of uh, type of access. So um, you, you, we're, we're, we're doing a lot in the, the dashboard uh, component of our product development. And you know, look for for the dashboard. It's not just about vehicles, right? There, it's it's really about expanding you know other pieces of equipment, other work zone areas, you know, variable message signs. Really, any type of asset, whether it's a moving or, or a stationary asset, and it's all about the connected assets that you guys are all managing, bringing that into our, uh, our centralized platform. Now, one of the other pieces of feedback we got from, from you know, folks like you is, hey, your, your dashboard looks great, but again, I'm, I'm already using a number of tools today. Can you just push that data into our existing applications and systems? So we've gone ahead and developed a, a real-time data feed called Fleet Fusion, which does just that. Um, and what happens here is all that information that's available in our Hoss Alert Safety Cloud dashboard, we also make available in raw data format to you to incorporate into your ATMS system, your TIM system. Um, you can connect it up to directly to you know, trigger messaging on, on VMSs and, and other, other types of um, you know, other types of systems that would benefit from that real-time information that Safety Cloud is uh, is, is aggregating. Um, so we're starting to see a lot of, of BOTs and, and, and TIM centers um, you know, really leverage the, the power of Fleet Fusion to add it to their overall uh, uh, data system. Now, it's actually great to hear the term digital alerting really be used as common language these days because uh, we really pioneered that term, um, and so we're really proud to, to kind of stand behind you know, what digital alerting means. And we're actively involved in, in various capacities you know, at, a, at a federal and, and legislative uh, le uh, level. 
uh, you know, we're, we're working closely, you know, mentioned in the emergency responder safety report. Uh, you know, digital alerting is part of, you know, move over task force uh, reports. Um, you know, Hostler submitted uh, digital alerting responses on the regulations.gov uh, websites and the, and the FCC Federal Register. Uh, you know, additionally, we are working with NHTSA uh, on various federal highway safety applications. Um, and I think we're, we're actually one of the things we're most proud about is uh, we've established uh, Arrow, uh, which is a nonprofit organization to support move over education and policy nationally. And if you guys want to check out uh, more about that, you can see the link on there. It's arrowcoalition.org. It's a little hard to see on the slide maybe, but arrowcoalition.org. Um, you know, the, there's, uh, there's some good information on there as well. So that's, uh, you know, that, that wraps up, uh, you know, what I wanted to share. You know, I look forward to, to answering some questions toward the end here. But really just to kind of drive home what we are all about. You know, we, we want to keep people safer, um, both your people as well as the drivers that are, that are on the roadway sharing the roads that you guys are maintaining, that you guys are keeping safe, that you're clearing, you know, for them. And it's really part of that partnership uh, and, and, and kind of collaboration where, where Hostler plays that role of connecting all these different things going on on the roadway together, you know, through our real-time safety cloud platform. So thanks, and uh, Paul, I guess I'll hand it back uh, over to you. Yes, sir. Thanks, Jeremy. Really appreciate it. Uh, the presentation and the work that you're doing and uh, the responder and motorist safety is near and dear to our heart. Uh, everyone, <laughs> everyone on the on this call is um, is passionate about about that topic in particular. Um, Jeremy, if you go back, people were asking for a few people. I think someone put a link in there about that study that you mentioned. Um, if you could just go back there and look. Otherwise, I don't know that there's any questions. And I will, I will mention that um, our our um, strong partner um, Todd Lace is from the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Has the hot alert, has alert. So, from a practitioner's point of view, if you guys want to chat with Todd, he's um, he's extremely helpful. He just helped me on something major this week, as a matter of fact. Um, please feel free to reach out to him. Yeah, that that study there, they're looking for the, um, the you know the, the study itself um, in the link, any link. Or, yeah, I, I can I can uh, I, I can send you over a link if you want to share it later. Uh, yeah. After the call. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. That's good. All right, then we'll move on. We'll move on in a timely fashion. Uh, I can say the next presenter's name because I had a next door neighbor named Mike Walsh, so I, I, I do I can do better with that, Mike. And um, I won't um, just uh, look at again look at the credentials uh, in the short bio that we we shared with everybody, and um, uh, so I won't get into that. And Mike, if you don't mind taking it away. Oh uh, well, thank you, Paul. Um, we appreciate the invite to participate, and thanks, Danilo, for organizing the panel, and I appreciate all of the participants for your time and your interest. I think critically what uh, Jeremy just said, and we are actively engaged in as well as what was presented in Jim's slides, um, we are here, MakeWay is here, uh, to change the fatality statistics, uh, both the first responders, work zone personnel, and obviously the motorists that drive on and share with us our roadways. Um, as uh, Paul said, my name is Mike Walsh, um, and I am the founder of uh, MakeWay Safety. My partners and I are pleased to be with you today and appreciate the opportunity to speak candidly on the emerging field of digital alerting. Also very pleased to share the panel with Jeremy from Haas and as well Ross from ICON, who are drawing attention and advancing our industry. In 2013, MakeWay Safety became the first digital alerting platform developed for use by first responders in DOT. We are the first patented product um, in the market. Our technology is tested and proven and ready for deployment, but we're not here to sell you a MakeWay device. What we're here to do is to establish a national digital, digital alerting standard, and we need your help to do that. Last, uh, in, in 2019, there were over $35 billion in loss costs associated to the loss of life, loss of asset, and injury to first responder and DOT personnel across the country. No. Yeah, there we go. 
All right, so this slide. Our technology and that of our co-presenters is to disrupt the distractions and the driving patterns of those who share a roadway, whether it's a conversation, music, texting, or emailing. Our technology sends alerts in real time, which demands that they turn their attention back to the conditions of the roadway, whether they are entering a work zone or hearing an emergency vehicle. When a driver receives our digital alert, they and you are in harm's way right now this very second. All it takes is one minute or a few seconds of distraction at highway speed to be in trouble. Our objective is to bring safety, to bring, to bring safely home everybody that travels on our roadways. Our objective is awareness, to make you aware that there are active technologies that have been proven effective, ready, and for deployment focused solely on improving road awareness and safety that's intended to preserve lives and assets. Our call to action is to enlist your assistance to demand that the technologies be integrated and deployed by our auto manufacturers, our cell phone carriers, and the phone manufacturers themselves. Remember that each of these corporations is a for-profit business and that they need to know that there's a demand, a need in the marketplace, and that, and that it will benefit their reputation and shareholder value. We have proven the need, we have proven the technology works, and we can prove there's a business opportunity for the likes of GM, AT&T, and Samsung. But your voice and your endorsements are necessary to motivate each to adopt the technology. As you can see from this slide, we believe that the emergency warning or digital alert technology uses three basic components. The transmitter, which can be installed in an emergency vehicle or established in a work zone, a control center in the cloud that calculates the intersecting speed and direction of vehicles, and the receiver, which warns a driver to an impending danger. We believe this third link in the chain, the receiver function, is the most critical of the three. And that's why we have spent the last five years focused on creating a ubiquitous solution that covers every driver on the road today, just not new connected vehicles. Our technology provides a hands-free audible warning sent to drivers in an alert zone or a work zone in real time. And I need to repeat that, in real time, so that they can yield to an approaching emergency vehicle or slow down, change lanes, and avoid a roadside work zone. We fundamentally believe that there is not much use in sending an alert if there is no one able to hear it. Hearing dramatically improves, as you saw from Jeremy's statistic, hearing dramatically improves the road awareness and the reaction time of those that are sharing our roadway. We have additional benefits in, within the Makeway Safety Platform as well. Obviously, we as well have a responder-to-responder -responder component. Um, the Doppler effect of hearing one's own siren mitigates the ability to hear another vehicle's siren. We, have, we can create a geofence around a work zone or an incident scene from an administrative dashboard located in a dispatch center. The response zone can establish these geofences that can pre-warn traffic before an emergency personnel team can be on site for conditions like flash flooding, down power lines, civil unrest, so that we can clear the way for better response time, safer response activity, and getting to those incidents on the roadway. All of that is a function of our administrative tool. We also provide digital alerting uh, protection for volunteer fire departments. There are over 600,000 volunteer firefighters in the country, and they are responding to their emergencies in their personal vehicles. 85% of the country's fire departments have volunteer firefighters. On this slide, Again, much like uh, Jeremy had mentioned, uh, we are partners with Waze, and Waze does a great job um, of providing benefit to their subscribers. But Waze is not real time. 
And that is the biggest challenge that we face with this relationship. Although providing great notifications when there's a parked vehicle on the side of the roadway um, or a radar trap um, ahead. We've got to be very, very careful about the assumption that Waze is real time. We also have concerns in use of Waze that it's crowdsourced. So people in the vehicles are providing the data that Waze is filtering and then providing to its marketplace. Some of you might say that something is better than nothing. Uh, we would disagree. If statistically, um, Waze um, penetrates about uh, one out of 10 uh, vehicles um, and or phones on a roadway today, and that's when it's 100% deployed. The next slide, thanks, Bill. So Waze is available on one of, of 10 uh, vehicles and or uh, phones today. The statistics that you can see there is that Waze users are about 30 million total subscribers to Waze today. There are 275 million, uh, 275 million smartphones and about 287 million total U.S. cars um, sharing uh, our roadways. So what, we're, what we are focused on um, is getting to the phone. The phones are the connection uh, until, the, until the connected cars have enough penetration in the marketplace. So GM and AT&T are businesses, and they're driven by their bottom line. We together must show the demand that there is a business opportunity that will benefit their reputations and shareholders. We need to fully activate both the connected cars, which is a Gen 2 opportunity for notification, while we have the phones in the car. All right, so this was an accident that just happened this past January here in St. Louis County. We had a uh, MoDOT truck that had pulled into the left far lane to remove a deer uh, from the highway. Um, the vehicle that you can see behind it um, was a delivery truck delivering bricks. Uh, MoDOT could not have done anything more uh, to put themselves in a safe way and provide notification that they were there and that they were stopped on a roadway. They had their attenuator extended. They had flashing lights provided. They had directional flashing lights provided. And we had a piece of makeway equipment on this particular truck. We have evidence that the makeway notifications were being provided through ways. Um, and yet, at the same time, we assumed that the driver of this vehicle either did not have Waze or didn't have Waze activated. Um, this was a 23-year-old fatality. Obviously, a life change um, in this environment. So the roadside in environment is as dangerous as traffic itself. So typical highway speeds and vehicle closure rates dictate the need for a quicker and more reliable, real-time received technology one that instantaneously provides the driver with the information they need to improve and increase reaction time and take the necessary precautions to avoid a potential incident just like this that occurred this past January. Okay, so this is our display in our connected car. Um, everything is focused everything that is being done today is being focused on the connected and autonomous cars. Um, GM, Ford, they're all focused um, on their connected capabilities. But 100% of cars are connected today through the phone. Everybody has at least one phone in the car at the time that they are activating in the car, present in every vehicle. Gen 1 of this digital alerting capability to put everybody in a safer light is the phone. We are not ignoring the fact that Gen 2 um, is the future. We have tested this with GM. We worked with their Buick division. Um, this is our screen as you can see it um, as it is promoted by General Motors. But the advent of the connected cars is going to be relatively slow. What we have available to us today is the phone. Makeway has both solutions, for phone and for connected cars. We have it tested, we have it proven, we have it deployed, and it is all ready for commercialization. So 
So this is information to share with you that kind of gives you the indication of the potential delays in the penetration of connected cars as a percentage of the total U.S. fleet that's in the marketplace today. The average car on the road today is 11 and a half years old. It is not only not connected, it doesn't have Bluetooth. The average cost for a connected car is $55,000. The average cost for a new car is $25,000. So we believe that there's going to be a socioeconomic disparity towards the completion of the penetration of digital um, alerting for connected vehicles. We believe that the phone will continue to be a, a medium of pronouncement to provide these types of digital alerting uh, to the occupants of the car to make our roadway safer for all of our work zone personnel um, and our first responder personnel. That's why we have focused on a broader involuntary solution for the receiver component. As I mentioned before, Waze is a voluntary app. You have to download it and you have to activate it. So I will ask a question and maybe you can provide me the answers later. But of all of those that are attending today, how many of you have the Waze app and how often do you turn it on? Statistically, the Waze app is primarily turned on during highway transportation only um, or when somebody needs directional assistance to their destination. We, st we believe that the phone is the immediate answer to digital alerting and warning of motorists that you are on the street. So we are looking and we have NDA signed with AT&T, Verizon and Sprint uh, to negotiate with them about actually embedding this technology into the hardware of their system so that it becomes an involuntary portion of their process daily as they travel our roadways. What we find most frustrating in life-saving technology is that this technology exists today. It's, it's ready for commercialization, but we continue to run into obstacles. That's why in my earlier slide, we need your assistance. We need to put together a voice and we need to create a demand and reflect that there is a market for us, for you, to enforce this type of technology on the carriers, on the auto manufacturers, on the original equipment manufacturers for the phone, that these measures are necessary to preserve life preserve assets. This, this slide just kind of gives you an indication that there's roughly 275 million phones um, in the marketplace. Um, and what we're talking about is coverage. Um, I'm sure you have all seen the advertisements for AT&T and Verizon um, as they put their coverage maps um, up on the TV screen. Uh, there are very few places in the country uh, that aren't covered uh, by a carrier. Um, if they are, they're probably mountainous regions or uh, desert areas uh, out west. But if you look at the coverage um, of those maps, we believe that that is the first solution uh, to this dramatic problem that you face and accept um, every day. This is a picture um, from the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. We can, we, can put, um, we can put an end to the majority of these types of fatalities, the majority of these types of, of injuries, but no technology is going to eliminate 100% of loss of life. But we can certainly reduce it through these available technologies. Uh, so what we are looking for um, is for you to join in a voice that we can put in front of AT&T, Verizon, and Sprint, that we can put in front of General Motors and Ford, we can put in front of our legislators um, to enact um, a, a solution to a dramatic problem uh, that we have faced for many, many years. In 2014, FEMA, um, along with the Fire Association, commissioned a study, um, and it is plainly evident that one of the leading causes of death and injury the first responders and DOT personnel um, is in route, uh, not on site. So that we're asking that you join our effort to demand attention from the carriers, the OEMs, and the auto manufacturers, our federal and state legislatures. Um, we're asking 
you to help us demand change. We're asking you to help us demand life. So our contact information is on this page. We would love to hear from you um, and put an energy behind the life-saving technologies that exist today and proven to work today. Paul, thanks. Back to you. Thank you, Mike. That's, um, I think it's a really, um, I know there's some always some cynics out there, but I think it's a really good, uh, like you say, approach, kind of force it into the phone. Phones. Everyone has a phone. Um, you know, the, the, the connected vehicles is, is, is a ways away, and even that might not, not going to guarantee inclusion where for the digital alert. So that's, um, I really like that idea. So if, if folks wanted to reach out to you guys, uh, you, would, you would sort of direct them how they can help with this uh, push to, um, you know, to the, you know, to the, you know, to yeah. help you with yeah. this push. Yeah, absolutely, Paul. Um, you know, we have had many, many conversations with leadership within the auto industry, um, within the carrier industry, um, and basically they understand the demand and the need. They, they understand the risk uh, to first responders and DOT personnel uh, that, that are sharing their roadways. It's very clear that they understand that. They've made it very clear to us, we have to prove to them that there's a business opportunity here. Um, and I think it's very simple done. Um, but we just need a unified voice from all of the affected industries, and that can include tow truck drivers and bus, bus, you know, bus drivers to, to put the voice behind it. Yeah, some of the associations that we're all members of, uh, the various responder, uh, uh, you know, organizations do do lobbying as a as, as a business as federal government. We we do not get involved in any of the government lobbying at all. So, um, but maybe we can maybe we can um, affect some of that later on, Jim and I. So uh, with that, um, again, Mike, thanks very much. Great ideas, great no presentation, and appreciate your time and your presentation. So, but well, with that, there's some a few questions in there. If you um, go scroll back. In there, Mike. But um, with that, I think we'll go to the ICOM presentation. And Ross Sleckler um, is going to uh, talk to us a little bit about ICOM here today. And um, with that, Ross, I won't. I'll stop talking and let you take it from here. Okay. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Jim. I'm, I'm here. I'm going to take this a little bit different angle because, you know, I, I agree with Mike and Jeremy. Uh, and we're we're sort of a different company here. We've been um, in the work zone technology space for about 12 years. Um, we come out of the truck telematics, truck tracking space, and and we've been from the very beginning uh, working on temporary traffic control as a information piece for the management and the routing of your vehicles. Um, the catch is you got to make the business case. It, it's one thing to say that, that this stuff needs to happen, um, and it's, as Mike was just saying, it, it's, it's about getting the business piece together. It's got to be affordable. It's got to be reliable. It's got to make good business sense for everybody. And it's taken a number of years to get there. The technology itself is not earth-shattering. We've had the technology to one degree or another for about 15 or 20 years. The, the, the end piece is making the business parts go together. So with that said, um, I always like to start by, by reminding everybody that we've been told for the last five or 10 years by the Googles and the Apples of the world that we're going to have a future with cars that will drive themselves. You'll be able to sit back, turn your chair around backwards, have dinner with your family, and watch a movie while the car go down, goes down the road. And everybody's going to be safer when this happens. Well, the, to a large degree, the future is today. We already have all the, the movie screens, all the technologies in the country, and we, we have cars where you have drivers laying back and going to sleep and letting the car drive itself. The, the difficulty is we're not really prepared for that future. Now, we can pick on a Tesla, and Tesla maybe deserves to be picked on, but there's a lot of deaths happening from this stuff, and, and some of these are... are um, images that we've seen before, the, the 405 accident, 
Um, it's, it's really amazing if you just pick up Tesla fire truck crash and, and search that. It's astounding the number of images that come up on this stuff. But it is real. It is today. Um, and we're only going to solve it if we, the professionals in the highway industry, step forward and do our part to make ourselves seen. Uh, this is the future. This is something that we all have to deal with. Uh, coming more from the work zone, temporary traffic control side, uh, we see it. We have you know good clients who um, are stepping forward out with their own dollars to do this from the general contractor side because they lose um, number a number of employees every year to these problems. So very sympathetic with the Tim's folks. Uh, we're there too. Uh, our approach is we're coming at it a little bit more from the, the broader temporary traffic control work zone space. So with that said, um, the reality is I personally don't believe that um, portable changeable message signs are being read by drivers anymore. We've got a long history in our company. We've done literally thousands of smart work zones. Um, putting radars out and uh, message boards up saying stop traffic two miles ahead. Um, and as you all know, you still get people driving to the back of the semi at the end of the queue. Um, and it's, it's anecdotal, but it, it's looking more and more like people are reading the signs less and less and they're looking up less and less. So it's no longer um, adequate just to have the flashing lights. Uh, we have to go direct to car. Um, we have to speak to the driver. We have to disengage the cruise control. These things are all possible. It's more of a business issue than anything else. So I want to encourage everybody, um, the people who have responsibility for buying equipment, for putting men and women on the road every day, you're part of the answer. Um, this is something that is changing fast. We're working um, intimately with several of the automakers. Um, we're making progress to getting in the dash of the car. Um, you know, we all work with Waze, TomTom, Tom, Google, all the all the navigation pieces. But it, we we really feel that it's important that we get into the car. We know that your ambulance is ahead. We know the lights are flashing. We can push that data right to the car. And the reason we need to get in the dash of the car, and, and I, I say this a lot, I say this to the auto guys, we need the cruise control turned off. And uh, believe it or not, the auto guys that we're working with, at least in principle, agree with that. Um, I'm not saying that they're committing to taking that positive action but that's the conversation we're having right now. Um, and, and in order to do that, we need large, multi-billion dollar companies to make strategic decisions on uh, working with data. And one of the things that you run into with that is the question, is there any data out there to work with? Um, five years ago, when the car companies started looking for work zone data, for temporary traffic control data, the answer was they would go to the state traffic center and download the schedule of work. And we all know how accurate those schedules are. And there really wasn't anything for them to act on. Over the last couple of years, um, our company has you know, completely saturated several states on work zone data. Um, we have a situation now where I w we can go to the car companies and say that your drivers, your customers are going to positively um, experience the value of incident data every day they drive their car. And that's, that's where we're at and the car companies are starting to pay attention. A big part of that is, uh, at least in our, in our company, uh, a lot of the general contractors are coming to us and saying, you know, we don't care if there's a mandate. We don't, we don't care what the the construction contract says. We need this for our people. And 
because they're stepping out ahead of any state mandate, that's really had an impression on the car companies. And we're going to get there. We're going to get there in the next two to three years where an, an action on a response vehicle, on a work vehicle, is going to arrive in car um, so that the, the computer in the car can turn around and act on it. Now, with that said, so that, that's really a lot of what Mike was saying. We have to do our part in the industry side, the highway industry side, to make the data available to the auto industry, and then the auto industry will turn, will turn around and do their part and act on that data. So with that said, that's a little bit of me preaching, and uh, please excuse me for that. So what we have done at ICON, um, coming out of the smart work zone, stop traffic two miles ahead sort of world for 12 years now, is we had to get things cheaper, uh, easier to use, so that we could do every job, every worker, every flagger, every arrow board, every truck. And we spent the last couple of years making that stuff happen. Uh, and what we've built is we've built a IoT platform, Internet of Things platform, that um, has been married with the equipment that we use for traffic control. Um, it, it goes into uh, work trucks. It goes into first responders' trucks. We mark cones on the side of the road. We mark flaggers um, standing in the road by themselves. We mark arrow boards. We mark utility trucks. We are picking up radar, using radars to pick up traffic speeds, looking for uh, collisions. There's a whole host of new tools out there that we're able to provide all off one Internet of Things platform. And one of the big ones, one of the hot ones right now, and um, is the, the crash trucks of TMAs. Uh, we are partnered with the biggest TMA builders in the country. Um, their TMAs come off the line with our stuff standard in it. We're starting to see, as somebody said earlier, fire trucks build out with TMAs. We're starting to see tow, towing operations, um, purchasing TMAs to back up their tow trucks. Um, it's a really great solution. Uh, we don't build TMAs ourselves. We build the IoT piece that goes on the TMA. We don't build arrow boards. We build the IoT piece that reads the arrow board and tells you which way to, to merge left or to merge left right. Um, there's a lot of new tools out there. We have temporary rumble strips that um, are built by a company called PSS. And they came to us six months ago and said, we need the presence of these rumble strips to not just shake the car, but we need it to go into the dash of the car and talk to the driver before they get to the rumble strips. So uh, these are all great tools for temporary traffic control. These are all great tools that can work for the TIM community. Uh, I encourage you to go out there and, and look at what we've done, also what Jeremy and Mike have done. Um, all this stuff works. Um, all of this stuff helps with your traffic operations center. These are big parts of um, the world ahead. And the industry needs to do their part and, and make the data available so the car industry can do their part and tell the driver. With that said, there is one more thing I want to point out. And I, I, I've spoken with, um, I believe it was Paul about this earlier. Um, one of the things that we're starting to see being sort of more leaning towards the construction side, our equipment is on the response vehicles, the road rangers of the world, the fire trucks of the world. But our equipment's also on the construction site. And, and one of the things that we would like to speak to the upper management of the greater Tim community about is you also have the ability to look at the parallel routes when you have an incident. And we were able to look at your TIM routes. And we're able to make decisions on what exactly, de what detour do we dump the cars off of when we close down an interstate highway. Uh, we've been through it a number of times. Um, 
where a horrible accident will happen on a route like I-57. Um, and they, the responders come out and, and dump everybody off onto the parallel road. And then that parallel road was, happened to be being paved at the time. And we have a secondary incident on that road. So the, one of the really positive things about everything that's happening in turning this equipment into IoT is we're able not just to see the incident, we're able to see the entire uh, temporary traffic control environment around the, the region. And we're we'll able, able to make very strategic picks on where we divert traffic to. Kind of off topic a little bit here, but it is one of those things that we do want to take the opportunity right now to, to say that um, there is a lot, of, a lot of visibility on all your parallel routes. There's a lot of information that can be used here. Uh, we encourage everybody to be part of the solution. And the thing that I, that I think has been most encouraging to the auto industry is that the highway industry has stepped forward over the last two years and really made this information. The data is available now. They can move forward and use the data. And that's because of decision makers moving to pick up equipment like this and make these things happen. With that said, I, I, I try and keep this short and uh, hand it back over to you, Paul. We like short and good presentation. I, I do like that uh, additional feature. That, see, we weren't aware. Well, I think with I think with all three of these technologies, there's data available, and you know we uh, we we push the use of data uh, to advance traffic incident management. Sort of like a next generation, Tim. We need to become more advanced in um, in understanding the alternates around an event, um, as you suggest, Ross. Is um, I think is is a, is a great aspect to the technology that we should we should explore more and more. So um, I thank you for that. That that was uh, not exactly on the topic today, but but an important important um, thing. So um, so we, we're going to put up some poll questions here. Our friend Nilo, Nilo is going to um, put all, put in there only positive information. Um, our, our positive answers. No, just kidding. With, tell us what you feel. Um, so, if you could take a minute, um, and while you guys, while you folks are doing that, I will um, just share with you. I was very uh, excited to see all the activity and some of the controversy that was going on here in the chat pod. Very cool. Um, it, we need we need to um, you know we need to hash out some of these concerns in order for us to move forward, right? We need to we need to have these uh, often difficult decisions um, that I think everyone is doing is doing a good good job there. So um, we ask we're asking up there what topics our Tim programs would like to see in upcoming webinars. Um, and um, so this will help us move forward in the beginning. Um, does your program wish to share or present during an upcoming webinar? Um, someone said no. A couple of people said no. Well, it's too bad then. Todd's always available to us. We know that. Um, but you know, it, it, I guess it's, it's part of our um, ongoing push that if you're doing something cool or something that you'd like to like to share with Tim Nation. Then um, we, we're always interested in, in um, hearing, uh, you know, good practice, or um, you know, a lot of times we hear something, we say, oh, that's something the rest of the nation could be served by. So um, just you know, keep that in mind. Um, another question is, from zero to ten, um, how likely are you to recommend a Talking Tim webinar to somebody? So um, let's go. Let's fill those questionnaires out. Don't make me come after you. Uh, and number four, um, how informative or useful were the presentations that were made today? So, and um, I, you know, I, I do, I do see some of the conversation. There were some questions here, but um, uh, and I'm glad John 
play devil's advocate today. Just so you know, John and I and Jim, uh, we've had some discussions in the past of, uh, of disagreeing op uh, opinions. So, but John is very, very strong partner and a very um, a good partner, and um, appreciate the, the perspective. Um, this is a question here from Bruce Vano, who is uh, uh, we haven't heard. I have I haven't heard from Bruce. He drew, Bruce is one of our res national responder uh, master instructors and a very highly respected person in the Tim community, retired chief. Um, Bruce is asking, is there an end user compatibility across the three products highlighted today? Can any any of the guest speakers answer that? Yeah, this is Ross. Um, it, this is kind of funny, actually, because Mike, Jeremy, Corey, myself, we all know each other pretty well. Um, there is there is some compatibility across the products, and um, there is going to be cooperation between our companies. Um, it the, the end goal is is powerful, and and we will get there. Um, one of the things that that Icon has done, we've we've t taken a very different role for the equipment industry. Uh, we don't build equipment. Uh, we have openly just decided to partner with the great equipment builders and partner with other people generating data. One of the things that we have in our system is we have all the paint, all the pavement marking trucks in the country in our system because the company who builds that controller is skip line and they have data but they they don't know they don't have the relationships with the auto companies. So we're consuming their data and, and, and sharing that with the rest of the world. We're doing likewise with some other equipment builders. And there's certainly room here for our the three companies on this call to work together. We all know each other very well, and we've all had those kind of conversations. Uh, I think you're going to see that um, the industry as a whole is going to have data everywhere and that data is going to get into the car. The exact uh, machinations that go into the business relationships are something that is going to take a little while to work out. But this, the, the, the thing that we all have to understand is that the private sector folks can't do this and go out of business doing it. Um, the auto companies have actually a, a fair amount of liability here that they're worried about. Um, they want to do the right thing, um, but up until two years ago, this data just wasn't available. And so they're moving fast to respond. Um, the more data that we as an industry um, generate for them, the faster they move. And um, I see actually a, a real easy win here for a lot of agencies and for the auto industry. You know. We're going to have cars without steering wheels somewhere between five minutes from now and 50 years from now. <laughs> yeah. um, but but let's do something really easy and just turn off the cruise control when we're approaching an ambulance. That's an yeah, easy. Paul, if I, we can do yeah, that. Paul if, I, Paul, if I can add to what Ross just said, um, and hopefully Jeremy would support this as well. The three of us are talking. Um, we have open communication with each other. Um, all three of us have expressed a, a sincere desire for collaboration. I don't think, I think the thing that, uh, as Ross just said, you, you know, we're all in business, um, and just like GM and, and AT&T. Um, but there really isn't, uh, on anybody's part that made presentations today, a selfish profit interest. This is about life safety, and we recognize that these individuals that are participating in this call today and those that are at work right now um, are accepting a danger um, as normal practice when they get out of bed in the morning. Um, so we are more than willing to collaborate. We believe that there are uniquenesses within each of our technologies that could benefit the marketplace at large. We just need the attention um, and we need the right data uh, to draw that attention uh, from GM, from Ford, from AT&T. Yeah, now this is Jeremy. Now, one thing I'll add uh, in addition here is, you know, going back to the original question, 
you know, the, the, the unifying system and the interoperability really, really comes in at the, at the system, at the application that is, is pulling together the, the data and delivering the alerts to the vehicle, you know, to the drivers. Um, so the, the interoperability is, is, is that software that's running and, and, and you know, consuming the real-time data you know, from, uh, you know, from our three companies. And if I can add, Jeremy, I think that's why we have all talked about, you know, a standard, um, a single yeah. standardized network for collection and distribution of that data. Excellent. Excellent response by all three of you. That was, uh, was good. I'm trying to see if there's any other um, – Any other, I mean, there's a lot of good discussion here. There's a lot of good points being made. But um, my own personal opinion is that having, you know, I think someone mentioned that we, we you know, we, we have these fatalities. And, you know, and frankly, we have a lot lot more injuries probably than fatalities. We know that, right? We just don't, we don't know the number. We don't have a hard and fast number. But I do, um, I do think that, you know, these, you know, Having having this technology that's that's doable, it's easily doable. Not easily doable, but it's the technology is there, I should say, and and we should um, we should uh, you know get behind it and, and push and push ourselves in the in the direction for the you know those the responder community we all work with. So yeah, you know you know one of the one of the challenges for sure is that. You know, we're, we're working with both, you know, governmental agencies on one side at, you know, federal, state, local levels, and then you know, the automotive community uh, on the other side. And, you know, to, to, to pick you know, two, two uh, industries that are uh, you know, relatively slow moving just because of the nature of, of, of how those industries operate, you know, seeing, seeing you know, monumental significant change happen quickly is, is a challenge. So I think we – we need to recognize that it's more of a uh, you know of a of a jog versus a sprint. Um, but the good news is that we've been jogging for a while now, and right? we've been you know all of us have been you know, doing stuff and and, uh, and making progress step by step. You know, so we're not we're not starting from ground zero today. We're you know, we're well on our way. Yeah, Jerry, it's it's well said. I, I think the thing that we also need to understand is that. You know, we have taken a very cautious angle towards federal and state uh, legislative uh, engagement here. Um, as, as my bio says, I spent uh, 35 or 40 years in the banking business, and uh, there's probably not too many industries more regulated than ours. Um, and what we found was when the regulators forced something on you, um, you did the minimum. You just did the basic minimum. Um, that's why we're looking uh, for this to really be um, an angle that is adopted by GM or AT&T as independent outside corporations that do this um, because there is a business opportunity, but also because there's reputational benefit. They are, they're under pressure, especially the phone carriers uh, are under a significant amount of pressure to find solutions for distracted driving because it's now obviously the leading cause um, of, of incidents on our roadway today. Um, we are hoping that they can find value um, that benefits both reputation um, and business um, and do the right thing. Um, but we need an, ener we need an energy. Uh, we need a unified energy um, and a standardized platform uh, to perform. Another question from uh, Chief Honor. Um, it, it's, I guess I think I have a sense of the answer, but I think it's probably mostly for Ross. But if anyone, um, how many DOTs are requiring contractors to implement the alerting technology as part of the contract? I think it's probably would probably be along more along the lines of the ICON. Um, but uh, Ross, have you run into that? Any state DOTs putting it in the in the bidding? Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Actually, there's, there's a couple, and um, uh, Iowa has declared that if you're going to have an arrow board on a vehicle or a trailer, it must be a connected arrow board starting last October. 
um, Nevada, actually Jeremy and I were just on a call with the Southern Nevada RTC. Uh, they're starting to require it in their contracts. North Carolina is starting to require it in some of their contracts. Um, interesting thing, though, uh, we're seeing more uh, general contractor adoption without requirements. Uh, we're, we're seeing probably 80% of yeah. our, um, our product go out the door for that. Um, and if I can take a second and, and kind of go back on the regulation thing, one of the things is, as you talk to the auto industry guys, they got burned really bad with DSRC. The feds had said that they were going to use DS, to mandate DSRC in all cars for about 10 years, and then it never happened. Um, so they're, they're a little bit gun-shy. Um, but on the, as I said earlier, on the on the very positive side, they're very much encouraged that the practitioners on the road are doing what they can do to make themselves seen. Um, they just share the data. Um, and so that while there is a little bit of mandate out there from some of the states, um, we're seeing the, the real power coming from the people who actually pay the workers to stand on the road and are worried about their safety. They're putting this out out of their own budget because it's important, and that's impressing the auto industry. That's, that's actually part of the business model, right? You, you have enough equipment that gets whacked you know, um, you know, just put off to the side for a second injuries and deaths. Um, you know, that just the, the, the amount of equipment that gets hit, um, you know, it might be worth the investment. It might, could be a benefit cost. And I don't know what the benefit cost is, but it just seems well, to me. I, um, I, you know. I'll, I'll take this public sector audience and ask a question. You guys are public sector, and the states pay, the states run the workman's comp insurance funds for all the states. You want to talk about insurance, can we talk to the state workman's comp board about encouraging this? Because there's, there's an insurance underwriter yeah. that is probably going to be very sympathetic to this group. Yeah, Ross, we, we've seen some municipalities who are self-funded just go bankrupt after a collision, you know, when there's a fatality involved. I, right. they, they just can't. They just don't have the money. You know, it, it's it's in the tens, in the, up to ten million dollars of uh, of fees associated with that. You know, side, you know, when there's a you know significant injury or a loss of life. Right, right. And for something yeah. like a few thousand dollars, uh, these same municipalities can uh, yeah make make their fire truck scene. Right. And, and, and it, 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 it pays off really fast. Yeah, yeah, Jeremy. So, Jeremy, to, so, your, to your Paul, if I can, Jeremy, to your point. Yeah. Um, just the city of LA in 2015 paid out 25 million dollars in death and injury claims to first responder personnel. Just the city, not the county. So, to your point about bankrupting a city, it can happen very quickly uh, with one incident. Yeah. So that I guess I guess that's. Part of the business case, right, for almost everything we do, but also, but in particular for the, this technology as we're talking about it today. I think we have about two minutes left, so I, I want to close the discussion here, but just offer my partner, Jim, if Jim, if you, do you have any uh, closing remarks here, Jim? Uh, not really, Paul. Just a big thank you to Ross, Mike, and Jeremy. Great, great presentations and a lot of great discussion here. Uh, and I'm sure folks are going to be following up, and and uh, who knows, good things yep. will will come about. So thanks right. again, hope, everyone. Yes. Yeah, just to remind. Yeah, just to remind everyone, this is part of our Everyday Counts initiative. These technologies, so we we can put you in touch with uh, you know anything that you might need outside of providing you with funding, <laughs> but you know some technology transfer, some sharing of information, or um, uh, and and also we would like um, like to hear from you if you are advancing any one of these technologies. It's good for us to keep track of uh, of that um, any progress we make in this area as well. So. 
With that, it's 3 o'clock. We like to close right on time. Everyone's busy. Um, I'll enjoyed seeing everyone on the chat pod today and all the, the list of participants. And uh, thanks again to our three presenters. You guys did an excellent job, as expected, and um, we appreciate it. So with that, everyone be safe, and uh, we'll talk to you um, all next month, if not sooner. Thanks again. Thank you.